Awesome. Thank you guys all for being here. It's going to be a great panel. I've heard it's been wonderful so far. So um, looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts on fads and hype <coughs> investing. Um, so as I mentioned, the panelists here are going to talk about fads, which is hype, um, and then versus trends, kind of longer sustained trends that kind of give rise to new industries, new companies, um, but kind of wanted to quickly set the stage on what is you know, a fad. And I think the first example that comes to mind is the tulip bubble of the 1630s, where the prices of, of tulips and the bulbs went up 20x in one month, and people were leveraging their houses and their all their investments because they thought it would be you know this amazing return. And then quickly uh, thereafter, all of the tulip prices crashed back down to what you could buy a tulip for. Um, and so that's kind of the first example of a fad that a lot of people think about. Um, and then kind of more relevant to the VC panel, there was the dot-com crash of the early 2000s. Um, in 1999, 25% <clears throat> of the companies that went public doubled their value in the first day of trading. So it was, it was crazy. Everyone was making money, and then all of a sudden, it stopped because by the end of 2001, a majority of the companies that had gone public um, had actually folded. But at the same time, um, in that kind of trough of post-crash sorrow, some of the largest tech giants that we know today were either growing like Google, um, Salesforce, or were founded like Facebook. So <coughs> I'd love to start with the panelists introducing themselves, um, saying their names, where they work, what they focus on, and then also the first word that comes to mind when you hear the word fads in investing, and one word that comes to mind when you hear, when you hear the word trends in investing. Okay, so I guess I'll start. Uh, I'm Jeremy Levine, I'm a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners, <coughs> and we do investing in little tiny seed companies that might be a person and an idea on a napkin where we might invest $50,000, or we invest in much larger, more mature businesses that still have a ton of growth where we might invest $100 million and we're, we're somewhat indifferent and do everything in between. Um, uh, about half my investing has been in consumer internet <coughs> companies. Um, I made early investments in companies like Yelp and LinkedIn and Pinterest and about half in more business software companies which you're less likely to have been familiar with unless you study that category. Um, and to answer the first question, I, you know, I use the same three words to think about trends or fads which is basically waste of time. Um, I don't think either one of them um, matter much for an investor because they both represent, to me, the conventional wisdom. If there's something as a fad, by definition, lots of people are excited about it. And frankly, if something is a trend, <coughs> a different lots of people are excited about it. And to me, to be a good investor, you have to find things that other people don't think are interesting or don't care about, which almost by definition means they're neither a, fend nor a, tre neither a fad nor a trend. <coughs> So I'm Joshua Siegel. I'm one of the uh, co-founding general partners of Rubicon Venture Capital. We are a bi-coastal firm, San Francisco, New York. Uh, we can invest pretty much anywhere in the world except for you know, North Korea, Iran, and Russia. So we pride ourselves on that. We do check sizes of 250 to 500K to start up to 2 million. And we're a generalist firm. So we'll invest in enterprise SaaS companies, FinTech, hospitality tech, insurance tech, logistics tech, and then a lot of direct-to-consumer brands. Uh, so my background is as a former banker, real estate uh, developer, and I'm also a former professional chef uh, here in New York. So a little bit about my background. Um, we also invest uh, late seed in Series A, so definitely further along than the cocktail napkin type of stuff, but we will uh, connect with entrepreneurs at that level, but we like to see a good amount of execution. In terms of uh, fads and trends, the words I would use would be fraud and waste. So we typically don't like to see that. <clears throat> and it goes hand in hand with what a VC's job really is, which is to see things three to five years out. So stuff that you hear about in the news today, all of us here have already seen or tracked for a number of years typically. Uh, so we're, we're ahead of the game, right? And uh, just like Jeremy said, we want to be in stuff that nobody else knows about or that a lot of other people have passed on and maybe they didn't see the light. And what you have to remember is a lot of great VCs also passed on the Airbnbs of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the Ubers of the world, you know, things of that nature. Any of you who have ever been in banking or know bankers, if Uber had been born in New York, it would have gotten funded in about five minutes, right? Because we've all dealt with the black car situation, right? So different kind of mentality on the West Coast. Still got funded, but took a lot longer, right? So just it's part of the mechanics. 
Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan Keaton, uh, founder of Torch Capital. We're, uh, Sam and I work together. Um, uh, we're a uh, early stage fo consumer focused fund, do seed and A primarily, New York based. We do a lot in New York and LA. Um, I was actually an entrepreneur most of my career, uh, sort of was investing on the side and finally made the transition. Um, first money in Compass and ZocDoc and Sweetgreen and Acorns and sort of companies like that. A lot more platform and or CPG. Um, and then uh, fad and trend. So yeah, obviously anything that's short term isn't uh, ideal, especially when we're looking at really long term opportunities. Um, I think for us, we really think about pain points and sort of what's really either going to change consumer behavior or pr provide a need, the companies that provide a, re a real need, and that's going to go beyond any fad or trend. So we're really thinking much more longer term. And so those feel short term, which we just sort of ignore and you know try to cut out the noise. Yeah, uh, so building on from that, I work with John at Torch um, to elaborate. $60 million consumer venture fund. <coughs> C checks are normally 250 to 750. The A checks are normally one to three million. Um, pretty broad definition of consumer, but brand is kind of central for anything that we look at. So really looking for mission-driven companies that are really hitting home with um, value propositions that uh, are really making life easier and more seamless for consumers. And a uh, pretty broad definition of consumer. We'll do a fair amount of food and beverage, traditionally in the kind of um, better for you category. Fair amount of retail and apparel, where sustainability is a core part of that thesis. Um, consumer health, where it's and fintech, which is really playing into trends around the democratization of goods and services and how you take a, a service or a product that was traditionally built for the few and kind of expand that to the, the masses within the states. Um, Within trends and fads, I think echoing the points that have been made so far, for us it's really kind of pain point driven. We're looking for companies that are really not n n nice to have, but really need to have. And I think if you operate under that investment thesis, <coughs> it's a lot easier to cut out a lot of the noise because you're thinking, is this an innovative business model that's actually going to be able to be around in the long run and fundamentally change the way this category works? So that's kind of the lens with which we think through these things. Got it. And can we maybe ask the audience kind of what, what their backgrounds are, maybe by a show of hands, who's a student? OK, that's a lot. That's a lot <laughs> are there any investors in the audience? OK, no. So uh, no. One, one half hand, a few hands. <laughs> so we'll tailor the, the dialogue. What about um, corporates? Anyone who's kind of at a, at a company? A couple? OK. So a lot of, a lot of students. So we'll, we'll make sure to have some Give some advice at the end for anyone who's interested in, in VC. Um, so I'll have to change all my questions now because they don't like fads or trends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we see them. <laughs> you see them. So we can talk about them. Um, so I guess in your career, has there been a time where you saw something that you thought was a fad maybe because a lot of people were interested in it or were talking about it that maybe you hadn't previously um, seen as, as this is something that is going to happen in the future and you maybe saw it too late and passed on it because you thought it was kind of this fad, but it later ended up being something that was um, more longer term and actually solved, solved a pain point that, that ended up growing into a, a big company and, and kind of whoever. Uh, I'll start. So back in 2013, I think it was, we had a conversation with the founder of uh, Zenefits. And so we were um, not sure about the space, but we knew that Trinet was the big player in the you know, PEO space and HR management and things of that nature. And we weren't sure that the founder was going to be able to uh, accomplish you know, his vision and so we ended up passing on the deal because we felt that uh, you know there was a well-funded incumbent and it just wasn't you know just wasn't going to work. That had uh, spawned an entire industry where you have you know companies like JustWorks, certainly Zenefits is still around, Namely, and you know there's a dozen others, and it's very localized on a state level. So that was something that we missed. Uh, the company went through some troubles and tribulations, but it still would have been a very good investment. When we looked at it, though, it was seed, and we don't do seed, right? We, do, we want to wait later. But that was something that uh, we didn't identify early, and it was a missed opportunity. So, yeah. I think, I mean, we look at a lot of um, food and beverage companies, and I think at the time when we were seeing 
within the last five years, all these trends towards veganism and gluten-free and sugar-free, et cetera, et cetera. I think I was probably more skeptical at first as to the sustainability of those trends and quite frankly, the reach they were gonna have beyond the kind of bi-coastal, more millennial audience base. Um, I mean, it felt like there was literally a new trend coming out every two months or three months. And I suppose that surprised me to an extent how much longevity has actually been seen, been seen in those kind of cross sections and is really kind of reflective of a much deeper underlying trend which we're seeing and we focus on in our investments around wellness and people in this world that we live in now where transparency is clearer than ever and companies are being held accountable for what ingredients they're putting into their products, et cetera, that um, you really do have a mass consumer mindset shift towards well-being both from the body and what they're putting into their body and also in the mind and what kind of content and how they choose to kind of uh, keep their minds sane in this world of increasing noise. So I think I was surprised by how far a lot of these trends have gone into middle America. Um, and we've seen the rise of tons of these businesses which have now been either acquired by the larger CPG players or have continued to grow into really profitable high demand businesses. So that was probably one area where it was on trend with where I thought things were going, but I didn't think it would happen and kind of pick up the amount of traction that we saw in the period of time that it has. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, you were um, early in Yelp, but there was that was a little bit, was it a crowded space at the time? There were a lot of companies getting bought, getting funded. How did you kind of pick that one as the winner? <clears throat> um, that's sort of a different question, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, Just in, in the, in the, it seems like a fad around that type of company. Um, yeah, fair enough. The, so one is the product was just different. And so the, the fad, if you will, the fad or trend, or the conventional wisdom at the time was um, to try to grow a lot of traffic quickly and motivate consumers by hook or by crook to tell their friends about a service and grow the service. And so if the folks here are mostly students, they're probably too young to remember, but there was a company called Insider Pages, which was extremely well-funded and prominent. There was a company called Judy's Book. There was a company that had been founded within uh, Intuit, which made QuickBooks and Quicken called Zip and Go. There were many of these companies and they were all doing, or in my view, they were all making the same mistake, which is they, would, they were trying to get consumers to leave reviews on businesses much the way Yelp was, but they were doing it in a um, sort of a high growth, low quality way. And they would do things and employ tactics like offer a consumer a $5 gift card to Starbucks if they would leave a certain number of reviews. And uh, lo and behold, if you offer a consumer $5 to do something, you quickly attract the least common denominator, which is, okay, how many reviews do I have to write for the $5? How many words at minimum do I have to put in a review for it to count? And you end up with a site full of stuff like, if you like, Joe's, if you like pizza, try Joe's Pizza. If you like getting your hair cut, try so-and-so's you know, barbershop. And it's all just junk. Um, whereas Yelp took a different approach. It wasn't trying to get lots of consumers. It was just trying to get deeply um, passionate users who wrote really high quality content. And so they, in many ways, although the idea wasn't uncommon, the approach they were taking was very uncommon. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a common theme across uh, many investments that end up working out really well which is sort of one founder is going this way while everybody else is going that way. Mm -hmm. And it turns out only with the benefit of hindsight do you realize that this way was the right way to go, that way was not. <clears throat> Got it. So even if it's kind of a common theme, it's the execution and someone who's doing it a different way. Interesting. Um, so I guess what is your guys' process for identifying, I guess I can't use the word themes or trends, but for identifying something that you think is going to be you know, that next industry or that next big company? How do you kind of think about it? So I think there are a couple lenses that we put on something. Um, you keep hearing Sam and I both talk about pain points, but it's what we found is looking at, I don't know, look about 500 companies a year and probably made about 50, 60 investments. Um, for consumers specifically, it's, 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 that's the first thing. Like, do people really, not just nice to have, but really, really need it? But then you gotta make sure the market's big enough. You've gotta make sure that there's, uh, for us, obviously, technology and the added addition of a platform it, which was behind ZocDoc and Compass and Acorns is, is, it makes it exponentially more powerful. But So that's the second thing. Is it something, even if it works in the way they're thinking about it, is it something that can grow and be big enough realistically? And then the third thing, obviously, is an avert overt simplification. But the third thing then is the entrepreneur. I mean, is it the man, is it the team that can, can get there or at least get it part of the way there? Are they thinking about things the right way? And that comes a lot down to pattern recognition of working with some of the top entrepreneurs, especially very early on, 
what are the challenges and how do they deal with them and what were the qualities in those people and the way the teams work together that you can say, hey, even if this isn't all figured out, we believe that they will be able to figure it out. And so it becomes to, again, sort of what they're solving for, how big the market is, how good the team is. Um, and that's sort of where it starts. Um, Trends and fads create a lot of noise around that because there's a lot of momentum with, within the VC industry, within the press, within immediate consumer behavior that can often take you off course. But if you keep really clean on those elements, those generally end up with the best and biggest companies in, in the experience that we've had. So I'll take a little bit of a contrarian view is that we try to actually stay away from pattern recognition because we're funding entrepreneurs that are usually uh, either first time entrepreneurs or you know they've they've worked in industries and now they're doing their own thing, or they're you know young enough that really it is their first company. Uh, but uh, the team element is very critical to make sure that they do have the expertise on the team, so they don't make silly mistakes. And so, one of the challenges I think we've all dealt with is that when an entrepreneur gets their first big funding amount, they have a tendency to overspend on things that aren't quite necessary. So discipline in the spend is critical. Uh, making sure they only have must-haves versus nice-to-haves themselves is also very critical. And you know we're seeing a deal flow in an order of magnitude of you know 5,000 deals a year plus just because we're a larger firm and and uh, buy coastal and see different kinds of things. But uh, you know the team element is critical, the product, the market, and the ability to execute. And so since we're not doing the seed, we're doing a little bit later where we want to see them generating at least a million dollars in revenue, you know, we're going to see that execution and we're going to know what's going on, right? Uh, so that's very critical. And I'll, I'll chime in with two things. One is that I'll tell you what not to do. Uh, well, let me step back. So one of the things we do internally at Bessemer is we, we do what we call road mapping, where we literally sit and think and try to identify areas that for whatever reason we have an hypothesis that suggests that area will be ripe with innovation, the potential for startups to outcompete larger companies. And then we, we do research, and we literally write reports or presentations which we share with each other internally that might say, I'm looking for companies that fit this general idea, and here's why I think this is a, a ripe area. And the best roadmaps <coughs> tend to be ones that are both correct and also ones that are in areas that most people aren't thinking about. Um, in order to do that well, one thing you don't want to do is read stuff like TechCrunch or Recode or all these other publications, which are great in telling you what everyone else in the tech industry is doing. Because by definition, those are essentially the fads and the trends everyone else is obsessed about. Um, and the thing that we spend some time doing, but also are looking for when we hear pitches from entrepreneurs, is uh, what are the problems people are facing, either in their lives as consumers or in their lives at work, that are unsolved. And many of the best ideas have come from an entrepreneur who was just really frustrated about something in his or her work life or personal life that they set out to solve. Um, and, uh, and sometimes they set out to solve them on purpose. Other times they ended up sort of solving that problem. And almost every one of the great companies uh, emerged in just that way. Um, and so looking for problems as opposed to what's hot or what's interesting um, is, is a much better way to go. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't one of the questions I prepared, but kind of in all these answers, a lot of what I heard is it's, it's, it's a lot about the entrepreneur and the, the kind of people and how they think about it and how they execute against that. So how much when you're looking for a company do you look for kind of how, how the business model works and how much do you look for how the entrepreneurs are solving the problem and thinking about it? I think a lot of it depends on the stage that we're looking at as well. If we're looking at stuff which is earlier and kind of seed and pre-seed, then in my opinion, the team's much more important to see if these people are actually capable of taking this from idea through to actual end product. I think as you get further down that curve, the KPIs and the metrics do a lot more of the talking. Um, I think, slight tangent, but in this day and age with where we are in the economy and where kind of purchasing power is at this point in time, we're particularly really focus on the customer acquisition side of things. And you know, a lot of people, it's very simple for a lot of these direct-to-consumer businesses where you can break it down as simple as a CAC to lifetime value basis. But I think looking for entrepreneurs who are really creative around customer acquisition and not just using, not being over-focused in one particular channel. Roman, which is one of our portfolio companies, they do a terrific job at diversifying their customer acquisition strategy. A lot of the companies that we've seen that are kind of over-indexed in particularly Facebook or Instagram, 
as the algorithms changed last year and as more competitors enter the market, you essentially have more people going after a fixed audience base and that essentially pushes up the CACs, brings down your contribution margin on the business. So for me at the moment in particular, I'm thinking through over the next 12, 18, 24 months, there's a, a lot of companies that we would have probably invested in two or three years ago, but when we think through if we were to see a turn in the economy, is this a business which is likely to experience inelasticity with demand and, um, and how much gross margins does this business operate with that gives a big enough buffer that if you see customer acquisition costs rise, <coughs> you still have a fundamental healthy business underneath it. So, um, but I think to the original question, a lot of it does come down to stage, but what I've seen continuously is some of the most innovative business models are also the most complex to pull off. And if you're dealing with folks who know that industry exceptionally well and have the relationships to navigate those hurdles, I think the likelihood of them overcoming it is much greater than someone who's uh, less versed in that space. So I would concur with uh, everything you said. I would just add from an enterprise standpoint, only because we look at direct to consumer but also enterprise tech, a lot of it has to do with uh, the customer acquisition, not just the cost, but the timeline and the cycle. So you could have a great leadership team, you know, technical co-founder and a visionary of strategy, but unless you have a head of sales uh, who may or may not be the CEO, but it typically is a separate uh, person that can execute on that vision, you know, you're gonna die. You could have the best product, but not be able to sell it, or it takes a long time to sell, and you've got a real problem on your hands, right? So your sales cycle is critical. I would say the team element overall, though, is a vast majority of what we look at, uh, along with the product and, of course, the market. The key there is there may not even be a market for some of this stuff. You may not know that the market exists. Like, who thought Slack even existed? Like, why would you even need a product like that? And now it's a multi-billion dollar company. And so things like that, you, you know, the market develops and you just have to see it. The critical element for us, and uh, I think it's true for all of us, is that the companies have to meet certain key performance indicators in order to get to the next round of funding. Because cash is king. So if you run out of funding, you are dead, right? And so you want to make sure that if you're funding them, they're going to meet the milestones that they have stipulated such that they're attractive to the next fund, right? I'll, I'll add one last thing. So um, on this sort of business versus team or founder question, the way I like to describe it is imagine, and most of the folks here were students, so most of them probably are not married, but imagine being told you have 30, you're going to meet somebody, and then you're going to have 30 to 90 days to decide if you're going to marry that person. It's sort of ridiculous. Um, and so the irony with investing in, in startups is that the long-term success of the startup um, and the outlier outcomes that you're hoping for are driven almost entirely by the team. But there's almost no way to know when you meet someone in the first 30 to 90 days, which is roughly how long you have to decide to make an investment, and as a founder, how long you have to decide to accept someone's capital. It's impossible to figure out who are going to be the amazing founders and who are going to be the lousy ones or the mediocre ones. And so even though the person or people drive the outcome, I spend 98% of my time analyzing the business and then hoping that if you pick the right businesses, even a mediocre founder will do OK. And if you happen to catch a fantastic founder, um, it's, it's obviously wonderfully multiplicative. Um, but uh, in hindsight, I, I studied computer science in college. I wish I had taken more psychology classes, because so much of evaluating the person involved is about understanding human psychology and, and evaluating you know, human characteristics. You don't do a whole lot of that in computer science classes. Um, and so uh, if you're still in school, um, my recommendation is try to pick up a couple extra psych classes. And whether you're an investor or a founder, you are essentially entering a marriage. Um, and by the way, like, and I'm ha very happily married, 14 years, three kids. But um, getting a divorce, as I've learned um, from, from, from friends and so forth, is incredibly messy and painful. And it's the same thing for an investor and a founder. And so both parties have a really short period of time to get to know each other and make what is not a lifetime commitment, but five or seven years feels like several lifetimes in a startup anyway. Um, and so figuring out how to make that decision is, is really important. I'd like to add it's a lot easier to get a divorce than it is to divorce an investor or to get, an investor, your cap table. To get, to get out of an investment. So if you take an investor onto your cap table, be real clear that you want to work with this person. And if you want an investor in a cap table, also be really clear, right? Because you can have a prenup, you can get out of a marriage, not too hard. 
Uh, but getting out of an investment, it's, it's very tough and very expensive. Yeah. Um, our investor said the same thing to us. And, and I don't know if it's the same in New York, but in California, it's easier to get a divorce than an investor off your cap table. So. <laughs> Um, I guess kind of to that end, and I want to leave some time for questions to, um, for those in the audience interest in, interested in VC, what's the best piece of advice you got, or kind of to your point of what you wish you knew, what's something that surprised you or, or wish that um, someone had told you before you started? VC takes a long time, so you might have an expectation that you'll get into a deal and all of a sudden it'll pop and be worth hundreds of millions of dollars and you'll get your money out pretty quickly. That rarely happens. I mean, it's a real rarity. So you've got to be really patient in VC. And you have to be able to accept a lot of disappointment uh, because you might work on a deal for a month, three months, whatever it is, and it just doesn't happen. And you're real excited about it. And you really want to do it. And this is especially true for, for those of you who are students and are going to become associates or things of that nature. And you'll work on a deal and really push for it, and it won't happen. And you will be so discouraged. And you have to get over that really quickly. Because we see a lot of deals, and they're just, they just don't come to fruition. And you got to move on, right? So that's the big thing. Uh, and I'll save some for. I'm, I'm going to back up, because I think it was how to get in. And I have very specific views on this, because like I said, I've been an entrepreneur. I actually started in the music business. And in college, uh, I loved music. When I started, I realized there was actual business behind it, and I slept on couches, worked for free, met people, met bands, met ex anything I could do to get in the industry. Money was an issue. It was all about just getting in. And I think VC now is sort of uh, very similar. My role, what I ended up doing was starting a management company. I managed a bunch of acts that did pretty well, and, and eventually I left that business. But there's a lot of similarities, and I think there is a, a potential corporate track in venture. but. I'm seeing a real shift in where venture's going. And I'm seeing a lot of the best new funds are by former, not all operators can be investors, but those who can make the switch and, and understand investing, having that understanding of what the entrepreneur is going through is, is enormously helpful. And I think my point is that uh, to get in, anything you can do to get in, it's not just like being an associate. I think working at startups, I think even interning, we've had a ton of interns from Columbia Business School, both Sam and I went to Columbia Business School. Um, we uh, is really just getting in is critical. And I think you have to think longer term, your positioning and who you're working with and what you're learning is going to be the best way to indicate success. Um, and yes, you definitely have to be patient once you're getting to make investments. But that path is pretty long, especially if you're joining a bigger fund. So uh, I would just say, do whatever you can to get in, work with companies, watch companies, even you know, put up a, a bunch of companies that if you had capital you would invest in and, and keep track of them and see what they're doing. But if you don't have that passion to do that, then maybe there's a different side of the business you're, you're better suited for. I would add to that as well. I think that um, in a weird way, I view it as an industry that if you're supposed to be a part of it, you'll find a way to make it happen. Um, and it can take, there's so many different paths you can take to get there. A lot of the best investors that I've worked with are ex-founders who have really honed in on a particular sector where they know the market, they know the ecosystem, they have very specific views on where things are heading, uh, trends, um, to, uh, you know, to, to really kind of stand out in that respect. But I think it just comes down to really diversity of experience. I was at Columbia Business School as well. When I was there, I was doing, I was interning with startups, doing BD. I was, I'd started something myself and I was running that. I was interning with all the angel networks, all the venture funds. And then it, a lot of it just comes down to kind of hustle and being scrappy. And I remember when I graduated business school, I had offers from a bunch of hedge funds and <clears throat> consulting firms and paying me these crazy salaries. And I met John at the time, and he said, look, I have this idea to kind of institutionalize what we've been doing and raise a fund. And I can tell you right now, I was not getting paid what I would have got paid at that hedge fund. But <laughs> true. It's a, um, I mean, it's the trade-off where it's kind of like you take a bet on the vision of what the fund's going to look like in two, five years down the line. And if you're prepared to really kind of hustle and put the work in. And also, it's, it's very suited to, in my opinion, specific characteristic type. There's a lot of you know, relationship building and being one step ahead of the curve. And psychology, for me, this is one of the biggest things that surprised me was how much of a role psychology plays in this in some shape or form, whether it's through building relationships, understanding dynamics, finding ways to get into deals that someone else kind of almost had closed, and you figure out an angle and, and a reason why the, venture, why the founder makes more sense to take capital from you. So. 
I think it's just one of those spaces where actions definitely talk louder than words. And if you're interested, start getting involved in some shape or form. Write a small check into a company that you're passionate about and um, really come with ideas and suggestions because given the nature of these funds, it's very hard to bring someone in day one and teach them everything from the ground up. Uh, I'll offer three, uh, three pieces of advice. One is um, the, the industry is over glamorized because like, we like to talk about and brag about our successes. We don't like to talk about our failures. Our successes make it into the newspaper. And it's a tiny little industry, maybe a few thousand people. And it, it gets a lot of ink, and so people get excited by it. But the reality of it is that, you know, in fact, a couple of the folks on stage mentioned they met however many hundred or thousand companies a year, but they make a small number of investments. And so the way I describe it is it's like being a garbage collector, the, the, the guy, the people who come by your house every week or whatever and pick up the garbage and put it in the garbage truck because most of the plans that you hear about, most of the pitches are totally uninteresting. And so you spend the vast majority of your time sifting through garbage. Um, now, of course, when you find something that's really exciting, it's phenomenally fun and it's, you know, it's a little addicting too. And so you forget about all the time you spent on lousy stuff. But if you don't have the patience to spend a lot of time trolling through garbage and you hope that like, everything you find is going to be interesting, it, that's not it at all. Um, so that's the first piece. The second piece is that uh, it's like, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to, to challenge my fellow panelists, like, it takes a former operator to say that former operators make the best investors. I think that's rubbish. I think if you want to get good at something, you go do it. Um, the idea that if you want to be a great investor, you should build and found a company, like to me, that's completely inane. If you want to be a great investor, go learn how to invest. Go find people who will teach you. Go practice it. Um, and then the last thing, which is related, is that you know, someone said to me the, um, in describing the difference between someone who likes to build businesses or operate them and invest in businesses is that when a, when a CEO or an entrepreneur comes across a mountain in his or her path, the immediate thought is, do I drill a tunnel through the mountain? Do I go up and over the mountain? Do I go around the mountain? And they immediately think about solving problems. And when an investor is walking down a path and comes across the mountain, they'll say, forget it. I'm going to go the other direction. Like, why bother trying to solve the problem of the mountain? And so if you, if you find your instinct is like you're trying to always solve problems and, and are interested in operational challenges, like maybe you should go build something. Um, if what you're trying to, if, if your mindset is instead trying to say, well, where are the best opportunities where for the risks involved, there are the, the most interesting rewards, then go be an investor. Um, and in my mind, the two are barely related. Um, and that the one thing an operator can do, and by the way, I never operated at anything. I've been doing this job for almost 20 years. It's, I had three jobs before it that lasted two years each. So they're essentially irrelevant at this point. And, uh, and as, a, um, as an investor, um, as I said, it, it's all about getting ex experience investing. And, uh, and ultimately, a really great founder wants a coach or a set of coaches who can help him or her think through challenges that they may have also had. I can't do that. I've never run any company. Um, and so, but what I can do is I can help those founders <coughs> find people that they can get that advice from who may or may not um, be investors. Most of the time, they aren't. In fact, they're still in it um, trying to operate and work on some other company. I'd like to add just one other thing. Um, try to be a value add, either investor or operator, whatever you're doing. So get to know your fellow students, get to know their background, get to know your network, so that if you decide to come into VC, you can not only you know, evaluate businesses and find them, but help them, right? So all of us up here and most of the VCs I know that are good are value added investors. A lot of them say it, some of them do it, some of them don't. Uh, but that's one of the most important elements that you can have uh, for being a venture capitalist. Awesome. And I think we have maybe five minutes. So if pe folks have questions, there's mics running around. State your question fast so we can, we can try to get it. Hi. Um, so I hear a lot about um, venture capital in the tech space or in the consumer product space. Um, I have a service, and I never really thought about venture capital, but now I'm starting to think as I envision something bigger. How do, what kind of advice can you give to someone who has a, a service that they want to grow as opposed to like a hard product or an app? I think the first question to ask is not every business is a venture capital like venture capital is not the right path. Like a, a service business that doesn't have any assets, or, you know, if it is a tech, a platform, something highly scalable, then it could be. Um, but 
like a consulting business is not venture, it's not the right capital source of venture capital. Um, certain things are just great businesses and then great for founders and there are other types of investors. Um, so it's, it's first has to be something that, you know, investor, venture capital is really focused on really big outsized returns. So something that can grow to massive proportions, a lot of businesses aren't that. Um, so that's the first thing, is venture capital the right path for funding? Um, there are many other funding sources beyond that. Um, and then I think the second thing is, is you know, through networks or whatever, meet some folks at funds and just get their, you know, ask that question to them and maybe give them a, a quick outline. I mean, uh, so I invested in Sir Kensington's, the ketchup company. It was uh, an analyst at McKinsey. I was working for Jack Welch, the former CEO of GE when I left, and I tried to hire Mark as my right hand. And he ended up, which was an amazing job, uh, he worked with us directly, and, and he turned me down because he wanted to start a ketchup company. And I said, that's a stupid idea. Uh, and then he's like, okay, well, you don't have to invest, but as my friend, would you just read the business plan? And I read the business plan, and it was phenomenal. He thought through so many things. He called so many, uh, sort of where the consumer behavior was going. He really nailed it. And so I ended up writing him a check and helping his, put his whole round together. So, you know, if he just told me on the street, I'd have said no way. But when I understood how he was thinking about it, and we sold that to Unilever for a lot of money about a year ago. Um, so just ask, start with your friends. It doesn't have to be a partner. It can just be anyone in venture, and they can start giving you perspective on if you think that makes, they think it makes sense. So I think um, out of both undergraduate and business school, there's some sort of classical paths. You know, there's banking, there's consulting. You know, mm -hmm. nowadays a lot of times just like Google PMs, you know, et cetera. And I think more and more you see people interested in going into venture. Uh, and so my question, you know, there are some venture firms, Bessemer, for example, that have these sort of analyst programs that I think you alluded to, um, and more and more that's starting to pop up. For people who are interested in, let's say, eventually making partner at a place like Bessemer or, or, or you know, eventually being one of the main principals at, at a shop like that, do you, would you recommend to all the panelists kind of going in from the ground up through like a sort of an analyst level or more sort of more through some other forms of financing, whether it's <coughs> banking or sort of the, the operator path? Um, are these all viable paths? You know, I've heard before that maybe the, the analyst um, starting from the bottom doesn't really work in terms of rising up in a VC firm that they're sort of capped uh, and then bankers and operators are the ones who kind of get in over that. What's the, what's the kind of truth to that and uh, what would your advice be? Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll answer that. Um, so, uh, you no, know, starting at the bottom is, I think, the best way to build a career anywhere. So, I actually started the analyst program at Bessemer in 2005. Our first two analysts now run their own multi billion dollar venture capital fund. Our third analyst is a woman named Sarah Tavel. She's one of the five partners at Benchmark. Two of the partners at Bessemer started as an analyst. There will be more. Um, and so, you absolutely can grow up in the industry. Um, many firms don't allow that, I think, or don't, don't facilitate that, because in order to create opportunity for new partners, either old partners have to retire or die, um, or the firm has to grow. Um, and, uh, and if you do this business well, I mean, it's, it's perhaps part of uh, societal problems. You can make a lot of money, and there's no reason to grow it. And so a lot of people say, hey, let's keep it really small, it's easy, um, and it's very lucrative. Um, and so if you're going to try to grow up in an organization, you just need to make sure you're in one where there will be more opportunities over time, which means that the organization itself <coughs> wants to grow, um, and therefore there'll likely be a, a spot for you. Now that said, the other thing about venture, which I didn't mention before, I described my, my garbage pickup metaphor, um, but there's a second metaphor which is equally important, and that is like you just have to get lucky. It's a really hard business, and it's very easy to get unlucky. I mean, you're investing in a company that's sort of a nothing, and you're hoping it becomes a multi-billion dollar enterprise. That's really rare. And so if there's one thing you need to wish for yourself more than anything else, it's get lucky. Um, it's very hard to, to make that happen. And then, of course, the way you can increase your chances of getting lucky is to work really hard at something, um, and that you can do. But uh, I would, one last thing, which is I think the common refrain amongst venture firms when they see a young person with no experience saying, hey, I want to come work at your company, is say, oh, like, go get a bunch of operating experience. Go work somewhere um, and then come later. And it's just, it's just like the easy excuse to sort of get, tell someone, like, please leave me alone. I don't want to reject you, but like, go get another job. But if you think about it for a minute, like, it makes no sense. Like, you want to work in industry A, so go work in industry B first, and then you can work in industry A. So I think if you really want to do it, you just have to um, do what my fellow panelists were saying earlier, reach out to 1,000 people. 
um, and see if you can find the one that lets you in. And in many ways, that is like a perfect proxy for what the job is, which is you're talking to a thousand entrepreneurs trying to find the one great one, and getting your job in, a, getting a job in ventures is much the same way. I would say also, it's also important to develop yourself in your own identity as a VC. You don't necessarily have to stay with the same firm through your career. That rarely happens. A lot of times people jump around and you're getting different experience and there's a different culture and venture capital firms by and large are fairly small. Uh, you know, the, there are only a few that are, that are quite large. And so it's, it's probably even a bit easier to start as an analyst somewhere and then get hired as an associate somewhere else. A lot of VCs actually don't even have analysts. Like we don't need that necessarily. And even, not even all that many have a lot of associates. Uh, but they, they, of course, are an integral part of the system. Get to know the associates first. Like, don't even bother talking to the GPs. We don't have the time. Talk to the associates, find out how they got in as well, right? And so that could be a, a great way to go in. And it's their job to talk to you guys as well, right? As, as well as, you know, fielding all the, the garbage. But if you want to do it, bring ideas. Don't just say, hey, yeah. how did it go? Like, find, you know, my, I have three companies I've been following I thought you'd be interested in. Or even if they're, and if they hate them, that's great. You're going to learn a lot from that. But you've got to, it's hustling on two fronts. It's getting in with the people, but also hustling for ideas and thinking through, um, you know, what value you're going to add to the person you're meeting with. Even if it is meeting a, an analyst at a firm that you're asking how they got there, bring ideas. So with that, we are at time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the panelists. Everyone. Thank you.